Good morning. <clears throat> it's uh, wonderful to be here together with you, even though this morning it would have been easier for me to have numbers of a song and a pitch pipe rather than what I have here, but I want to faithfully serve in what God has, has entrusted to me. Um, yeah, may the grace of God be with us and his spirit be in our midst. We need that to understand his word and to, and to, to just apply to what he has in, in it for us. <clears throat> uh, to open, I thought I would first read a couple verses out of Ephesians. Ephes Ephesians 1, verses 1 through 6. So first off, it's Paul's greeting to, to the Ephesians, and then, uh, then he uh, goes on to uh, three, redemption and Christ. Uh, the redemption of Christ is a little bit more of the focal point, but I'll start reading from the beginning. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. <clears throat> Actually, I'll just read to verse 3 as, as of now. So, he has blessed us with spiritual blessings in Christ. Blessings of pardon, of peace, redemption, and adoption. Anyway, as some opening thoughts... Um, I think we would all, most of us would say, at least in some way, we've had a wonderful week. The weather was beautiful, wasn't it? It was so peaceful. It almost felt like nature was at peace with itself. We're thankful. I believe all of us are thankful to be in a country where we do not need to fear dropping our bombs around us as millions of people are facing today. We, so there's, we do, not, we do not fear that anxiety that only war can bring. Um, so that somewhat sets a little bit what I had in mind for today. It's, uh, I was, I was uh, struggling back and forth, what, what should the topic be? Um, I ended up give, uh, giving it the title, Our Warfare. So um, we do not, uh, as we'll have later, we do not war as in artillery and deleting people, but we, we are in a warfare. Did you realize this morning when you stood up, you are in a war. You are in a fight. Um, there is there's a conflict between, the, between darkness and light. Um, <clears throat> And uh, one thought that I would like to, for us to th take with us as, as we go through the message is uh, in our, uh, or I'll just uh, start this line of thought a little differently. So this topic came to me during the, uh, during the time when we had a choir singing here and the song, It Is Finished about the conflict that was uh, on the cross. Thank you. <clears throat> so so uh, the way the song goes, there was a conflict between light and darkness. There was a line drawn and a fight continued. Jesus won the battle. And that, that battle is still r raging. And uh, in this battle, do, do, are we... Yeah. Do we are we okay to be only defensive or do we want to be offensive? Um, and I think for some of this, us, this wording is going to be a little difficult, so I'll try to explain it a little bit. So um, I'll I'll explain it in in a game of king's base. Most when I grew up, we called it single base, but when I was teaching, we called it. Uh, uh, call it King's Base. So you have these different teams. And if you watch it a little bit, you'll see it. If it's a small team, there's a smaller team and a larger team. It gets towards the end of the game. And there's a lot of back and forth. 
Usually, the small team will play defensive. We don't want to lose what we have. So you're simply trying to reserve what you have. That is then your defensive. You just, just defend. If you're offensive, you go and try to gain territory. Yeah, you get it? So in your battle, in our battles, are you okay? Am I okay to simply be on the defensive or do you want to go offensive? Do you, do you, and this goes also to, into furthering God's kingdom. Are we okay to be defensive or are, do we make effort to go beyond that? Um, so uh, this is a message that came to me at that time. And uh, um, there's something that I didn't realize how difficult it would be to collect my thoughts. There were, or I should say, there were, there's a lot of things that I wanted to say, but how to combine them together to make them make sense. So, uh, so bear with me as I struggle through that a little bit this morning to, uh, to collect my thoughts and, and uh, go through it collectively. Um, we will be looking at two different stories in the Old Testament and then later draw lessons from those as we go through things from the New Testament. First, we'll be turning to Exodus 17. So both of these lessons are from, uh, from the Israelites in their, in their uh, journeys. And uh, so they had just, just exited uh, or just left. Uh, they'd been freed from the bondage of, uh, of Egypt. And uh, to my understanding, there were probably around the $600,000 not dollars, 600,000 people that had left. So it gives us a little bit of an idea what group of people they were They were traveling through. They had witnessed the plagues that happened uh, in, in Egypt. They had walked through the Red Sea and uh, so on. Now they, were, now they were facing with a different conflict. So uh, I'll, I'll just read uh, Exodus 8 through 13. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel and Raphidim. So just a little bit on Amalekite. Uh, the Amalekites were descendants of, uh, of Esau. Um, so kind of we would say it were their relatives. Um, and Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy. So they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. So here was a victory. As long as Moses' arms or hands were up to God, they were winning. When, when he got tired, he let down his, his hands, they failed. So here, here, here he was watching from the mountaintop. I imagine as the battle line was kind of going back and forth. Um, so uh, later we'll, we'll see if we can draw some lessons from this. Next we will turn to, uh, to Numbers 22. So here we have the story of, um, of Balaam, we would sometimes refer to as. Um, well, we'll just kind of brief over chapters 22, 23, 24, and some of 25. 
we won't, for the sake of time, we won't read it all, but we'll, we'll take uh, parts out of it. So here it says, Then the children of Israel moved and camped in the plains of Moab on the, on the side of the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, the son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. So I'll, we'll just back up a little bit. We'll just take a brief notes out of the previous chapter. Um, just to give us a little bit of a context, what Balak was facing here. So in, uh, in verse, uh, sorry, uh, chapter 21 is how they defeated. Uh, so the Canaanites from Horma fought against the Israelites and seemed to be winning in the beginning. But after vowing, after the Israelites vowed to the Lord, that they would utterly destroy this, this city, the Lord gave them victory. So, so they're again a complete victory. Then uh, the Israelites, uh, Israelites asked to go through the land of the Amorites. King Sihon denied the privilege and fought against them, them only to, do, to be de defeated by the edge of the sword. Again, they were just moving through. It seemed like there was nothing that would stop them. Then uh, King Og, king of Bashan, fought against the Israelites. They wanted to destroy them till, there, till no survivor was left. So this is what Balak would see. So he had these Israelites camping right next to him. He knew what had happened in the past. And he, he just felt he had no chance against these Israelites. Um, all right, then we'll... I'll do my best to just kind of skip through these chapters. Um, it's sometimes a little difficult, but we'll see the best that we can do. So I'll read some more, uh, uh, verse by verse, some more. And Moab was exceedingly afraid of the people because they were many. And Moab was sick with dread because of the children of Israel. So Moab said to the elders of Midian, now this company will lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So they're, they just felt like, just like a cow or ox, whatever, eats grass in the field. It's just, the grass stands no chance. So that's how they felt. They had no chance against, uh, against Israelites. And the prince of Moab arose and went to Balak and said, Ben, sorry, I think I, I skipped over here some that I didn't want to. Um, so anyway, as it uh, as it continues, um, no, I should just read rather than skip over. And Balak, the son of Zippor, was king of the Moabites at that time. Then he sent messengers to Balaam, the son of Beor of Pethar, which is near the river in the land of the sons of his people, to call him, saying, Look, a people has come from Egypt. See, they cover the face of the earth and are settling next to me. Therefore, please come at once. Curse the people for me, for they are too mighty for me, because I shall, because I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land for." Okay, therefore, please come at once, curse this people for me, for they are too mighty for me. Perhaps I shall be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land, for I know that he whom you bless is blessed and whom you curse is cursed. And so it keeps going on with that. Um, and uh, so these men, these men come to Balaam, ask him to come. Balaam says that I first need to inquire of the Lord. Now, to me, it sometimes seems a little confusing. Who actually is Balaam? What did he know of the Lord? Where or where did he, what, was he actually um, a faithful follower of the Lord or was he just conscious, conscious of God? So it's um, quite often we criticize him as somebody who, he had an intimate relationship with God and he was, he should have known better, which he, which he probably should have, but uh, the scripture doesn't give us that very well. And the first time around, he refuses to go. And uh, the second time, more noble servants are being uh, sent over to ask him, and he, 
He says he will inquire of the Lord again. The Lord this time says, uh, go. And, uh, and, he, and he went. Um, I'll, I'll read a little section here again. And God came to Balaam at night and said to him, If the men come to you, rise and go with them. But only the word which I speak to you, that you shall do. So Balaam arose in the morning, settled his donkey, and went with the princes of Moab. Then God's anger was aroused because he went, and the angel of the Lord took his stand in the way as an, adver as an adversary against him. Again, for the sake of time, I will just kind of skip over this a little bit. So we know that the donkey didn't want to go, it ended up to where, um, where the angel was in ahead of the donkey with a sword in his hand, ready to slay Balaam. The donkey wouldn't go any farther. And, uh, and lay down, or Balaam was beating it, the donkey lay down. And, uh, and the donkey asked, why do you beat me? Haven't I always served you? And Balaam was so angry, he said, if, it, if, I, had a, if I had a sword here, I'd kill you. And, and, uh, and he saw the angel and whatnot. Um, so, uh, and uh, the, Balaam been realizing that, uh, that he needed to speak only what God spoke. I'm cutting this very short. He goes over and he blesses the, blesses the Israelites. Balak thinks, he, well, maybe he just got this wrong. Well, let's try it the second time. He blesses them again and the third time. And, uh, and uh, Balak gets really upset and says, don't you know that I could have that I could have given you riches and honor and whatnot, but God has withheld that from you. So the part that I'm trying to get to is, which is not in Numbers, but is in, uh, uh, in Revelations 2 verse 14. But I have a few things against you because you have those, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. So I have not found very clear exactly where and how this happened, but it seems after these blessings, ba Balaam caved in somewhere and he gave advice to Balak, what you can do to defeat Israel, tempt them with immorality. And uh, some commentators will say that immor immorality included idol worship. So in other words, idol worship included uh, uh, immorality. So, uh, and then in, in chapter 25, uh, I'll, I'll just read a, uh, just a short part from that. Now Israel remained in, in Akakia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to, this, to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people and hang the offenders before the Lord out in the sun, that the fierce anger of the Lord may be turned away from Israel. Um, so Moses said to the judges of Israel, Every one of you kills his men who were joined to Baal, to Baal of Piar. And indeed, one of the children of Israel came and presented to um, presented to his brethren a Midianite woman in the sight of Moses and, and in the sight of all the congregation of the children of Israel who were weeping at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Now when Phinehas, the son of Eliezer, 
the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he arose from among the congregation and took a javelin in his hand. And he went after the men of Israel into the tent and thrust both of them through the men of Israel and the women and the woman through her body. So the plague was stopped among the children of Israel. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. So, so if I could say it this way, simply through tempting them and luring them away into adultery, they were, we could say the, uh, that Balak and his people were able to kill 24,000 people. Um, now we'll, we'll switch to some of the New Testament and later we'll, we'll see if we can draw a couple lessons from the section that we, uh, that we read. Next we'll be turning to Ephesians, uh, Ephesians 6. So um, I will first take um, verse verse twelve. Then we'll then I'll back up to verse ten and read through verse thirteen. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. So, um, so in other words, we are not. We are not fighting as they were in the Old Testament with, with swords, spears, and whatnot. Uh, but our warfare is, uh, uh, is uh, fighting against spiritual hosts of wickedness. Um, I will now back up to verse 10 and read through verse 10, 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and, the, and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So, um, we may not often say it this way, but, but our battle is against spiritual darkness, against wiles of the devil. Um, of, um, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. So, so out of our own, we cannot, we cannot find victory in, in in this in this battle that we are in, um, so so to bring it a little closer to home, I was uh, I was thinking of what just just to give it a little bit more context. What are these things that we are battling with? Um, I may make this over simplistic or complicated, whichever way you want to put it. But if you are battling, or I should all word this a little differently. If you or I are unforgiving, we do not forgive. We are giving in in a spiritual battle. We are. It's a, if we if we choose to not forgive. We are, we are choosing to not, or to let the evil forces be victorious in that area. If there's jealousy in our, uh, um, jealousy, which often comes in the form of self-pity, it is a spiritual battle. You see, if um, the way I like to put it, if Satan can trip us up in these areas, it takes us away from an offensive battle. 
we are now not taking time to take away from his kingdom, if, if you will. Um, we may be tempted to chase after money and, and temporal pleasures rather than furthering the kingdom of God. If we give in to that, then again, we are not, we are not in conflict or we're not taking in enemy territory. Um, if we have internal conflict in the church, now I'm, I'm talking about a local, local body of believers, not the church in general. But if we have conflict, if we fight and, and uh, each other, bite and devour, as, as James puts it, we are now not effectively um, fighting an offensive battle. Um, so, so I would like to, to encourage us, let's fight on the offensive, not just the defensive. All right, um, a couple, um, um, couple words of, an, uh, of encouragement on that. Uh, I can see this, this topic can feel heavy. How can we do that? Like, we, we need to do this, but how? Let, let's turn to uh, 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 10. Second Corinthians uh, 10, verse 4 through 6. I think I'll re start reading from verse 1. It might give us a little bit more context. Now I, Paul, myself am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in... Who in who in present and lowly among you, but being absent and bold toward you. But I beg you, when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Um, yeah, I'll just do it through, through verse, uh, actually, I read a little further than I was thought. But anyway, my, the point that I want to make here, for uh, in Christ, we have the weapons, not simply to just, um, to just re keep what we have, but to pull down strongholds, to, to make advancements. Um, let's turn to, uh, to Romans Eight as a for 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 closing thought. Um, Romans eight verse. We'll be reading verse. Um, verse thirty five through um, through thirty nine, and prior to that, I would just like to make. Uh, uh, some remarks, we are, uh, so Christ's battle was won on, on the cross. His victory was won. And, uh, but your and my battle is still raging. I was, as I listed some of these battles that we are battling with. Um, and, uh, I'll be a little careful on this and say they may not always be the battle of our uh, eternal des uh, eternal destiny. Uh, so, so get me, don't get me wrong on this one. If we willfully 
allow sin in our lives, we are on a decline. We're, we're, we're losing ground, and not, we're not just keeping, but we're losing ground. So, um, and if we are not, if we don't keep that in check, we, it will go to the point where salvation will be lost, I believe. But your and my battle is still raging. There's a, there's a battle that is raging for our hearts. Um, and uh, as the notes that are put here, an 18-year-old may be battling against the pride of life and an 80-year-old battling discouragement, but we are all in a battle. We need each other. We need to encourage each other. Um, so I would say, let us take courage. We can be more than conquerors through him who loved us. And uh, let's just read Romans 8, verse 35 through 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? So, so here, this can be understood two different ways. One would be, who can separate us? In other words, he can, he can convince Christ not to love us anymore. But I, but I, and the other one is, um, what can happen so that, that I will not love Christ anymore? And that's from the perspective uh, that, I'm, uh, that I'm thinking this morning. So who shall um, separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet, yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of Christ, for the love from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So in Christ, if our focus is on Christ, we can be victorious. We can be defensive and offensive. We can further our battle. And just one thought that I would like to insert uh, before closing is how much can you willfully take from the enemy and still be victorious against him? How much sin in your life can you willfully allow and yet be victorious in your battles? I think it's very cl clear to us in, in, uh, um, in, a, in the example of King's Base or in also in a, in, a, in a war as we see today. You cannot take things from the enemy or admire things from the enemy and take it with you and then, and then fight against them. And I think so as well. So I would like to encourage us to faithfully fight the battle. If there's something that the Lord reveals in your life that you're taking from the enemy or you admire or you're drawing from the enemy, um, I would just encourage us. Let's eliminate, uh, eliminate that. Let's put that aside so we can faithfully serve the Lord. I would ask you to please stand up for a word of prayer. Our almighty heavenly Father, we bow before you. Father, we... Uh, We've looked at a very, very small portion of your word about a battle that is raging between the power of darkness and your power. Father, we, we see it around us. We see the havoc that, that the power of darkness like uh, wants to make and does make. But Father, my desire is that we as your people would... Uh, would not give in to the powers of darkness, but rather that we would, that the powers of darkness may be broken down through your power and that your kingdom may gain um, ground rather than losing ground. Father, I just pray, may you, may you strengthen us and give us a vision of, uh, of your battle for us. Father, I just pray for your, for your con continued guidance and protection. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Can you be seated?